welcome back to our Experiment Explained series. The goal of this video series is to provide you with short, digestible, and high yield reviews of experimental techniques that you're likely to see on the end cap. My name is Vikram Shah, and today we'll be looking at everything you need to know about polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, for the end cap. We'll look at the figures, controls, and common places you'll see PCR on the biology and biochemistry section of your exam. By the end of this video, you'll feel confident in your ability to analyze PCR experiments that may show up in any context on the NCAP. PCR is a common technique used to make copies of a specific nucleotide sequence. To understand how these copies of nucleotides are made, let's first review the process of how a cell duplicates its own DNA. DNA duplication happens every time a cell divides. For a cell to make a copy of its DNA genome, a few enzymes are required. Let's take a look at this image. Enzymes called helicase and DNA topoisomerase are used to unzip the two strands of DNA that are bonded with each other. These two strands need to be separated so that the other enzymes have access to the nucleotides in each strand. An enzyme called DNA primase adds short fragments of nucleotides to a single stranded piece of DNA. These short fragments are called primers and are the starting point for the formation of a new copied strand of DNA. These primers are absolutely necessary for DNA to be copied. Without the presence of primers, the next enzyme, DNA polymerase, won't be able to function. DNA polymerase is the workhorse of DNA replication. It's a huge enzyme that continuously adds new nucleotides to the growing chain of DNA. The end product is a long, continuous strand of newly synthesized DNA that's complementary to the original strand of DNA. Since DNA is a double-stranded molecule, and since both strands of DNA can be replicated at the same time, the end result after one round of replication is four total strands of DNA. After the second round of replication, there are eight strands of DNA. And after the third round of replication, there are 16 strands of DNA. So what does DNA replication have to do with PCR? Well, if you understand all of the elements of DNA replication, then you're very well prepared to understand PCR. That's because PCR is essentially the same process, but adapted to happen in test tubes instead of cells. Suppose we have a strand of DNA that needs to be duplicated in a PCR environment. The first step in duplicating DNA is to untwist the double helix and separate the two strands. In the cell, the enzymes helicase and DNA topoisomerase took care of that. In PCR, we can do this by applying a little bit of heat or temperature. This process of adding heat to split the DNA into two strands has a special name, which is known as denaturing. The second step of DNA synthesis was adding some primers to both of the DNA strands. Remember that a primer is just a short strip of single-stranded nucleotides. In the cell, primers are made by an enzyme called DNA primase. In PCR, these primers can be synthetically made according to a sequence the researchers desire and then are simply added to the test tube. The process of adding single-stranded primers and allowing them to bind is called annealing. The third step of DNA synthesis was to continuously add new nucleotides to the growing strand of copied DNA. In the cell, this was done by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. In PCR, we simply use a different form of this enzyme known as TAC polymerase. TAC polymerase is a heat-stable polymerase, which means it won't denature at the high temperatures we need in the PCR reaction. The process of growing the complementary strands is known as elongation. So to recap, there are three distinct steps in the PCR process. Step one, denaturation. The double-stranded DNA in the test tube is heated to slightly higher temperatures in order to melt and separate the two strands. Step two, annealing. Specific primers are added to the test tube, and the test tube is cooled to allow the primers to bind to single-stranded DNA. And step three, elongation or extension. The enzyme DNA polymerase is used to make a long and continuous strand of DNA. After these three steps have been completed, the end result is two identical copies of the same DNA sequence. The three steps can then be done again, and the end result would be four identical copies of the same DNA sequence. So let's take a moment and step back. We haven't yet defined the phrase PCR. What do these letters stand for? Well, they stand for the phrase polymerase chain reaction. Let's break that down a little bit more. The P in PCR stands for polymerase. Remember that DNA polymerase is the workhorse enzyme that's used to put a long, continuous string of nucleotides together. 
The C and the R in PCR stand for chain reaction. Once the first round of DNA duplication is done, the new copies of DNA that were made can actually be used as templates for the next round of duplication. So as long as there are enough starting materials, the process of DNA duplication in PCR can repeat itself over and over and over again without running out of DNA templates. So this is what's typically done during PCR experiments. A machine known as a thermocycler simply repeats the three steps over and over again. A typical PCR experiment or protocol might result in 30 to 40 rounds of duplication that can be completed in just a few hours. After those 30 to 40 rounds of duplication, there could be as many as 2 to the power of 30 or 2 to the power of 40 copies of DNA, which is millions and millions of copies of DNA that were created from just one original double-stranded piece. So to summarize, PCR is a laboratory technique that can be used to copy pieces of double-stranded DNA. It can be extremely useful in amplifying DNA or taking a really small amount of DNA that might be hard to detect and making a large number of copies that would make it much easier to detect. For polymerase chain reaction on the MCAT, there are a few key ingredients you're going to need to know. So here's what we need. The original piece of double-stranded DNA to be amplified, primers which are specifically designed by the experiment and synthetically made, DNA or TAC polymerase, DNTPs, which are free nucleotides that can be incorporated by DNA polymerase, and buffers, which maintain the environment of the solution so that the DNA polymerase can work optimally. There are a few variations on PCR that you might see on the biology and biochemistry section of your MCAT. qPCR, or quantitative PCR, is used to quantify the amount of DNA that has been produced. So this might be determined using a fluorescent probe that can be visually seen when it's bound to double-stranded DNA. Reverse transcriptase quantitative PCR is used to amplify pieces of RNA. To do this, a reverse transcriptase enzyme is first used to convert the RNA to its complementary DNA. That's what the RT stands for. This first step needs to be done because DNA polymerase can only work with DNA and not RNA. So researchers often use RT qPCR, again real-time quantitative PCR, to compare different levels of mRNA present in a cellular sample. For example, they may look at tumor expression of an mRNA molecule before and after treatment with a potential new therapeutic. Once the PCR is completed, the large amount of DNA that's made can be subjected to other experiments, such as southern blot. To review what a southern blot is, you can check out our last experiment explained video discussing western blots and related techniques. Now that you have a good understanding of PCR, let's take a look at some real-world examples of applications you might actually see on the MCAT. Here's an example of a PCR-based figure you might see in a passage on the biology and biochemistry section of your MCAT. While you would normally be provided with more context and information, we'll ignore that information for the sake of simplifying this figure. So when it comes to interpreting any sort of graph presented to you on the MCAT, one of the first things to consider is breaking down the information presented on each axis of the figure. We'll go into the TAID-P method in just a few seconds, but first we want to point out some PCR-specific information. So here, the y-axis shows the mRNA expression of several different mRNA transcripts relative to a control, right? That's why we see it divided by beta-actin. Beta-actin is a highly inconsistently expressed transcript, which is why it's a helpful control for this experiment. In this figure, let's now go ahead and apply the TAID-P method. First, the title keys us in that we're looking at RT-QPCR analysis of pro-inflammatory cytokine expression in the lungs of hamsters under certain conditions. Now, let's take a look at our axes. The x-axis appears quite complicated, but the researchers have nicely laid out several sets of independent variables for us, as denoted by the plus and minus signs. For example, looking at the tall purple bar in all three graphs, we see that they're acid positive, spike 6P positive, and B38 cap negative. The passage related to that figure would have provided more information on what exactly the acid spike 6P and B38 cap mean. We already discussed the y-axis independent variable, but again, we're looking at the mRNA expression of several pro-inflammatory cytokines relative to a control. The pro-inflammatory cytokines we're looking at here are IL-6, TNF-alpha, and CXCL10. Finally, the most important part of TAID-P, are there any patterns that you see? Fortunately, these graphs have given us bars that denote statistical significance, which makes our job much easier. Given this, you can quickly observe that the purple bar is the tallest across all three conditions, 
and it has some statistical significance relating to a couple of other conditions. Beyond that, on test day, simply keep this information somewhere in the back of your mind and keep moving through the passage or onto the questions. If a question asks specifically about those figures, you'll be able to quickly pull that information back into the front of your mind and go back and quickly analyze the figure. We've talked a lot about polymerase chain reaction for the MCAT. Let's now think about how to approach PCR-related questions. When answering questions about PCR, there are two common pitfalls to keep in mind, and this is something we emphasize to all of our students. First, keep in mind that PCR can only tell you information about the nucleic acid that's being quantified. For instance, RT-QPCR can only tell you how much mRNA is being transcribed. The results of PCR can't necessarily tell you how much protein is being translated from that mRNA. This is because the actual ribosomal translation of the mRNA might be upregulated, or mRNA that's being produced is also being rapidly degraded. As such, the amount of mRNA doesn't give us any additional information as to the protein expression. This is a very key point relating back to the central dogma, and the test writers love to trip students up here, so be careful. Second, be sure to keep an eye on the levels of statistical significance. This will be true for most of the quantitative figures presented on the MCAT. If there are no symbols that indicate statistically significant differences, then the quantities that are presented in the figure may not indicate anything meaningful. PCR, or polymerase chain reaction, and related experimental techniques often appear in the biology and biochemistry section of the MCAT. Throughout this video, we've learned what PCR is and how to interpret any results and figures. We've also discussed real-time quantitative polymerase chain reaction and how you'll need to understand that experimental technique for the MCAT. We hope this video has been a helpful resource for you in your MCAT study. If you'd like an MCAT question of the day delivered to your inbox every single day, click the link in the description below. In addition, feel free to leave us a comment if there's an experimental technique you'd like to see in one of our next Experiment Explained videos. Finally, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video if you'd like to see some more videos like this. We'll see you next time, and happy studying!